Part 5 of Time Crime by H. Beam Piper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Time Crime Part 5 Gathard Dard and Antrath Alv, temporary local aliases Ganadara and Atarazola, sat relaxed in their saddles, swaying to the motion of their horses. They wore the rust-brown hooded cloaks of the northern Jezeru people, in sober contrast to the red and yellow and blue striped robes and sunbonnets of the Calaras, in whose company they rode. They carried short, repeating carbines in saddle scabbards, and heavy revolvers and long knives on their belts, and each led six heavily laden pack horses. Koruhin Irigad, riding beside Ganadara, pointed up the trail ahead. From up there, he said, speaking in Akalan, the lingua franca of the North American West Coast on that sector. We can see across the valley to Kariba. It will be an hour as we ride, with the pack horses. Then we will rest and drink wine and feast. Ganadara nodded. It was the guidance of our gods, and yours, Koruhin Irigad, that we met. Such slaves as you sold at the outlander's plantation would bring a fine price in the north. The men are strong, and have the look of good field-workers. The women are comely and well-formed. Though I feared that my wife would little relish it did I bring home such handmaidens." Koruhin Irigad laughed. "'For your wife I will give you one of our riding-whips!' He leaned to the side, slashing at a cactus with his quirt. We in Kariba have no trouble with our wives, about handmaidens or anything else. By Safar, if you doubt your welcome at Kariba, wait till you show your wares, another Calera said. Rifles and revolvers like those come to our country seldom, and then old and battered, sold or stolen many times before we see them. Rifles that fire seven times without taking butt from shoulder. He invoked the name of the great Lord Safar again. The trail widened and leveled. They all came up abreast, with the pack horses strung out behind, and sat looking across the valley to the adobe walls of the town that perched on the opposite ridge. After a while, riders began dismounting and checking and tightening saddle girths. A couple of Caleras helped Ganadara and Atarazola inspect their pack horses. When they remounted, Atarazola bowed his head, lifting his left sleeve to cover his mouth and muttered into it at some length. The Caleras looked at him curiously, and Koru Hinirigad inquired of Ganadara what he did. He prays, Ganadara said. He thanks our gods that we have lived to see your town, and asks that we be spared to bring many more trains of rifles and ammunition up this trail. The slaver nodded understandingly. The Caleras were a pious people, too who believed in keeping on friendly terms with the gods. "'May Safar's hand work with the hands of your gods for it,' he said, making what, to a non calera would have been an extremely ribald sign. "'The gods watch over us,' Aterazolo said, lifting his head. "'They are near us even now. They have spoken words of comfort in my ear.' Ganadara nodded. The gods to whom his partner prayed were a couple of paratime policemen, crouching over a radio a mile or so down the ridge. "'My brother,' he told Koru Hinirigad, "'is much favored by our gods. Many people come to him to pray for them.' "'Yes, so you told me, now that I think on it.' That detail had been included in the pseudo-memories he had been given under hypnosis. "'I serve Safar, as do all Caleras. But I have heard that the Jezeru's gods are good gods, dealing honestly with their servants. An hour later, under the walls of the town, Koru Hinirigad drew one of his pistols and fired all four barrels in rapid succession into the air, shouting, Open! Open for Koru Hinirigad, and for the Jezeru traders Ganadara and Atarazola, who are with him. Ahead black-bearded and sun-bonneted, appeared between the brick merlins of the wall above the gate, shouted down a welcome, and then turned away to bawl orders. The gate slid aside, and, after the caravan had passed through, naked slaves pushed the massive thing shut again. Although they were familiar with the interior of the town, 
from photographs taken with boomerang balls, automatic return transposition spheres, like message balls, they looked around curiously. The central square was thronged. Caleras in striped robes, people from the south and east in baggy trousers and embroidered shirts, mountaineers in deerskins. A slave market was in progress, and some hundred-odd items of human merchandise were assembled in little groups, guarded by their owners and inspected by prospective buyers. They seemed to be all natives of that geographic and paratemporal area. "'Don't even look at those,' Koru Hin Irigat advised. "'They are but culls. The market is almost over. We'll go to the house of Nebu Hin Abanos, where all the considerable men gather, and you'll find those who will be able to trade slaves worthy of the goods you have with you. Meanwhile, let my people take your horses and packs to my house. You shall be my guests while you stay in Kariba. It was perfectly safe to trust Koru Hin Irigat. He was a murderer and a brigand and a slaver. But he would never incur the scorn of men and the curse of the gods by dealing foully with a guest. The horses and packs were led away by his retainers. Ganadara and Atarazola pushed their horses after his, and Faruhin Oberans threw the crowd. The house of Nebuhin Abanaz, like every other building in Kariba, was flat-roofed, adobe-walled, and windowless except for narrow rifle slits. The wide double gates stood open, and five or six heavily armed Caleras lounged just inside. They greeted Koru and Faru by name, and the strangers by their assumed nationality. The four rode through into what appeared to be the stables, turning their horses over to slaves who took them away. There were between fifty and sixty other horses in the place. Divesting themselves of their weapon in an anteroom at the head of a flight of steps, they passed under an arch and into a wide, shady patio, where thirty or forty men stood about or squatted on piles of cushions, smoking cheroots, drinking from silver cups, talking in a continuous babble. Most of them were in cholera dress though there were men of other communities and nations in other garb. As they moved across the patio, Gathon Dard caught snatches of conversations about deals in slaves, and horse trades, about bandit raids and blood feuds, about women and horses and weapons. An old man with a white beard and an unusually clean robe came over to intercept them. "'Ha, lord of my daughter!' You are back at last. We had begun to fear for you, he said. Nothing to fear, father of my wife, Koruhin Iragod replied. We sold the slaves for a good price, and tarried the night feasting in good company. Such good company that we brought some of it with us. A Terezola and Ganadara, men of the Jezeru. Kavuhin Avaron, whose daughter mothered my sons. He took his father-in-law by the sleeve and pulled him aside, motioning Gathon Dard and Antrath Al to follow. They brought weapons. They want outland slaves, of the sort I took to sell in the big valley country, he whispered. The weapons are repeating rifles from across the ocean, and six-shot revolvers. They also have much ammunition. Oh, Safar bless you, the white beard cried, his eyes brightening. Name your own price. Satisfy yourself that we have dealt fairly with you. Go and return often again. Come, lord of my daughter, let us make them known to Nebu Hin Ebenos. But not a word about the kind of weapons you have, strangers, until we can speak privately. Say only that you have rifles to trade. Gatha Dard nodded. Evidently there was some sort of power struggle going on in Kariba. Koruhin Irigad and his wife's father were of the party of Nebuhin Abanaz, and wanted the repeaters and six-shooters for themselves. Nebuhin Abanaz, swarthy, hook-nosed, with a square-cut graying beard, lounged in a low chair across the patio. Near him four or five other Caleras sat or squatted or reclined, all smoking the rank black tobacco of the country and drinking wine or brandy. Their conversation ceased as Kavuhin Avaron and the others approached. 
The chief of Kariba listened to the introduction, then heaved himself to his feet and clapped the newcomers on the shoulders. "'Good, good,' he said. "'We know you Jezeru people. You're honest traders. You come this far into our mountains too seldom. We can trade with you. We need weapons. As for the sort of slaves you want, we have none too many now, but in eight days we will have plenty. If you stay with us that long—' Kariba is a pleasant place to be, Ganadara said. We can wait. What sort of weapons have you? the chief asked. Pistols and rifles, lord of my father's sister, Koruhin Irigod answered for them. The packs have been taken to my house, where our friends will stay. We can bring a few to show you, the hour after evening prayers. Nebuhin Ebana shot a keen glance at his brother-in-law's son and nodded. Or better, I will come to your house then, thus I can see the whole load. How will that be? Better, I will be there too, Kavu Hin Avaron said, then turned to Gathon Dard and Antrath Alf. You have been long on the road. Come, let us drink cool wine, and then we will eat, he said. Until this evening, Nebu Hin Ebenaz. He led his son-in-law and the traders to one side where several kegs stood on trestles with cups and flagons beside them. They filled a flagon, took a cup apiece, and went over to a pile of cushions at one side. As they did, three men came pushing through the crowd toward Nebohin Abenaz's seat. They were a costume unfamiliar to Gathon Dard, little round caps with red and green streamers behind, and long, wide-sleeved white gowns and one of them had gold rings in his ears. "'Nebo hin Abanoz, one of them said, bowing. "'We are three men of the Osasu cities. We have gold obus to spend. We seek a beautiful girl, to be first concubine to our king's son, who is now come to the estate of manhood.' Nebo hin Abanoz picked up the silver-mounted pipe he had laid aside, and relighted it, frowning. Men of the Osasu, you have a heavy responsibility, he said. You have the responsibility for future of your kingdom, for a boy's character is more shaped by his first concubine than by his teachers. How old is the boy? Sixteen, Nebuhin Abanoz, the age of manhood among us. Then you want a girl older, but not much older. She should be versed in the arts of love but innocent of heart. She should be wise, but teachable, gentle and loving, but with a will of her own." The three men in white gowns were fidgeting. Then, suddenly, like three marionettes on a single string, they put their right hands to their mouths and then plunged them into the left sleeves of their gowns, whipping out knives, and then sprang as one upon Nebu Hin Abanaz, slashing and stabbing. Gathon Dard was on his feet at once. He hurled the wine flagon at the three murderers and leapt across the room. Antrath Alv went bounding after him, and by this time three or four of the group around Nebuhin Abanaz's chair had recovered their wits and jumped to their feet. One of the three assailants turned and slashed with his knife, almost disemboweling a cholera who had tried to grapple with him. Before he could free the blade, another Calera brought a brandy bottle down on his head. Gathon Dard sprang upon the back of a second assassin, hooking his left elbow under the fellow's chin and grabbing the wrist of his knife hand with his right hand. The man struggled for an instant, then went limp and fell forward. The third of the trio of murderers was still slashing at the fallen chieftain, when Antrath Alv chopped him along the side of the neck with the edge of his hand. He simply dropped and lay still. Nebuhin Abanoz was dead. He had been slashed and cut and stabbed in twenty places. His throat had been cut at least three times, and he had almost been decapitated. The wounded cholera wasn't dead yet. However, even if he had been at the moment on the operating table of a first-level home timeline hospital, it was doubtful if he could have been saved and under the circumstances his life expectancy could be measured in seconds. Some cushions were placed under his head, and women called to attend him, but he died before they arrived. 
the three assassins were also dead. Except for a few cuts on the scalp of the one who had been felled with the bottle, there was not a mark on any of them. Kavu Hin Avaron kicked one of them in the face and cursed. "'We killed the skunks too quickly,' he cried. "'We should have overcome them alive, and then taken our time about dealing with them as they deserved.' He went on to specify the nature of their deserts. "'Such infamy!' "'Well, I'll swear I didn't think a little tap like I gave that one would kill him,' the bottle-wielder excused himself. "'Of course, I was thinking only of Nebo Hin Ebenos, Safar receive him.' Antroth Alv bent over the one he had hand-chopped. "'I didn't kill this one,' he said. "'The way I hit him, if I had, his neck would be broken, and it's not. See?' He twisted at the dead man's neck. I think they took poison before they drew their knives. "'I saw all of them put their hands to their mouths,' a cholera exclaimed. "'And look, see how their jaws are clenched!' He picked up one of the knives and used it to pry the dead man's jaws apart, sniffing at his lips and looking into his mouth. "'Look, his teeth and his tongue are discolored, and there is a strange smell, too.' Antrath Alf sniffed, then turned to his partner. Halitane, he whispered. Gathon Dard nodded. That was a first-level poison. Paratimers often carried halitane capsules on the more barbaric timelines, as a last insurance against torture. But, holy name of Safar, what manner of men were these? Koru Hin Irigad demanded. There are those I would risk my life to kill, but I would not throw it away thus. They came knowing that we would kill them, and took the poison that they might die quickly and without pain, a cholera said. Or that your tortures would not wring from them the names and nation of those who sent them, an elderly man in the dress of a rancher from the southeast added. If I were you, I would try to find out who these enemies are, and the sooner the better. Gathon Dard was examining one of the knives a folding knife with a broad, single-edged blade, locked open with a spring. The handle was of tortoise shell, bolstered with brass. In all my travels, he said, I never saw a knife of this workmanship before. Tell me, Koru Hin Irigad, do you know from what country these outland slaves of Nebu Hin Abenazes come? You think that might have something to do with it? the cholera asked. It could. I think that these people might not have been born slaves, but people taken captive. Suppose, at some time, there had been sold to Nebu Hin Ebenaz, and sold elsewhere by him, one who was a person of consequence, the son of a king or the priest of some god, Gathon Dard suggested. By Safar, yes, and now that nation, wherever it is, is at blood feud with us, Kavu Hin Avaron said. This must be thought about. It is an ill thing to have unknown enemies. Look! A cholera, who had begun to strip the three dead men, cried. These are not of the Usasu cities, or any other people of this land. See, they are uncircumcised. Many of the slaves whom Nebu Hin Ebenaz brought to Kariba from the hills have been uncircumcised, Koru Hin Irigad said. Jezeru! I think you have your sights on the heart of it." He frowned. Now, think you, will those who had done this be satisfied, or will they carry on their hatred against all of us? A hard question, Antrath Alv said. You Caleras do not serve our gods, but you are our friends. Suffer me to go apart and pray. I would take counsel with the gods that they may aid us all in this. End of part five.